In this lecture, I will go through ancient Mesopotamia. Keywords include Fertile Crescent, Sumer, Epic of Gilgamesh, Babylon, and King Hammurabi. I'll talk about things I think every thinking person should know. If you just want the summary of this lecture, jump to the summary section at the end of this video. In the previous lecture, I went through prehistory, so feel free to pause this video and watch the full lecture or just the short summary. As mentioned in the lecture on prehistory, a civilization requires the following three things, in my view. So first, a certain way of life special to the society. Second, a system of supporting many people. And third, economic surplus. Now, in general, when historians talk about ancient civilizations in the context of world history, these historians, uh, they give a lot of weight to the following for ancient civilizations. Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Indus Valley, and China. Yes, there are other ancient civilizations, but my understanding is that we focus on these four and not the others because it's just more useful to explain and understand the key events in world history that is to come. In this lecture, we will focus on the earliest civilization of the four that we just mentioned, and that is ancient Mesopotamia. So the story of the ancient civilization starts in a small city, but before we get into too much detail, I need to first introduce the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent is a crescent-shaped area around the Middle East that was very favorable for agriculture. Therefore, many people and tribes gathered around this area, and it is thought to have been a melting pot of different people. Hence, it is also thought that most cultures and ideas can be traced back to this point in history. Now, with this in mind, let's talk about the first observable ancient civilization. This civilization is called Sumer and is located in the southern region between two rivers called the Tigris and the Euphrates. I'm sure some of you, or a lot of you, have heard of these two. Now, Sumer literally means Southern Mesopotamia. It is believed that this civilization started in a city-state called Eridu, around 4000 BC. A city-state refers to a small city that self-governs themselves, acting like a state, therefore called a city-state. So, who were the Sumerians? The Sumerians were a group of people with different ethnic backgrounds, which makes sense when considering they were in the Fertile Crescent, a melting pot. But then, you know, what really united them? What made these people of different ethnic backgrounds identify as the Sumerians? Well, it would do you good if you think back to the definition of a civilization I gave you earlier on, and hopefully it will ring a bell. So, they were united through a common way of life. Specifically though, their cult or their religion differentiated the Sumerians from other groups. Some notable call centers are in Eridu and a place called Uruk. The, the other criterion that the Sumerians fulfilled was that they had economic surplus. 
We are able to confidently say this because of the way the potteries were made back then. There's strong evidence that suggests that the pots were mass produced, which wouldn't really make sense unless they had more than enough food, right? And finally, they had a system to support a lot of people. And I'll first explain the general overview, then get into the details. So Sumer was a theocracy, meaning that the city was ruled based on religious monarchy. And under this theocracy, the inhabitants of Sumer were required to bring all their harvests to the temple located at the center of their city, and then the priest king would redistribute it among the inhabitants. And this was the system of supporting many people. Now, you may ask how we know this. We know this through the writings, or I guess drawings is more accurate, but these writings or drawings were discovered at the temple sites. At the earliest stages of Sumerian civilization, they drew these signs called pictograms, which some of you may link to the hieroglyphics in ancient Egypt, which is a good connection. And um, they used this writing system called pictograms to keep track of economic activities. So it's quite different from our alphabets. Right? And it was only later that their writing system evolved into this thing called cuneiform, which allowed for the communication of prose and stories, which would be more similar to our alphabet. Now, why did I say that it allowed them to communicate stories? Well, that's because there's this old prose, old myth, old story that was very crucial to the Sumerians. And this happens to be the oldest known story in the entire world. And it's this religious story called the Epic of Gilgamesh. A real person called Gilgamesh is recorded and is believed to have existed and ruled the city of Uruk around the early 3rd century BC. And this story is about this guy, right? This guy called Gilgamesh. And the story is dated to have been written around 2000 BC. The basic storyline is as follows. A demigod called Gilgamesh, so half person, half god, he becomes a close companion with another person called Indiku. And these two guys, they, they anger the gods, which results in Indiku's death after a series of events. And this event, this death of Indiku, causes Gilgamesh to somewhat go through some kind of existential crisis, which leads him to search for immortality. He hears that a king in another city was granted eternal life for living a good life, and that he was also saved from a flood by making a bow. Now Gilgamesh, he goes to search for this king, and he eventually meets the king, and finds the plant of eternal life. But sadly, the plant gets eaten by a snake. Some of you may be surprised by its similarity with some biblical themes and stories, especially the account of the flood and the guy who was saved by creating a boat. And it's true that uh, a lot of scholars would link these two stories, the Bible and this epic of Gilgamesh. 
Okay, so now this myth is very important for modern scholars because it allows us to have a glimpse of how the Sumerians understood the world. In ancient myths, we can find almost everything about ancient life. And that's because in these stories, the ancient people would distill basically their whole worldview. Now, um, if you want me to go more in depth about the Epic of Gilgamesh or even other ancient myths in general, kindly let me know in the comments section. So the Sumerians were quite special. They were distinct in that uh, they were very religious when comparing to other ancient societies. Some scholars suggest that this is because of the highly unpredictable environment in Sumer, which motivated religious beliefs to become the bedrock of Sumerian society. And this kind of makes sense. Okay, so by about 2250 BC, more gods personifying nature appears in the Sumerian tradition. For example, there were gods of water, of air, of love, war, and so on. And what I personally found quite interesting was the existence of these three male gods who were the most important deities in the Sumerian hierarchy of the gods. So the first male god that um, appears is Anu, and he was the father of the gods. Next, Enlil was um, who was the most important god since nothing could be done without his existence and he was referred to as lord air and finally enki the god of wisdom who worked closely with enlil and was a teacher and a life giver now does this sound kind of familiar as well I think it kind of resembles the Christian view of the Trinity, but that's just my speculation. Anyway, the direct influences of Sumerian religion on the inhabitants' lives were seen both socially and politically. The Sumerians performed many rituals to show their submission to the gods in return for prosperity and good life. Politically, as mentioned earlier, Sumer was a theocracy. The religious background of this is that the gods owned all the lands and that the king or the high priest, the high priest was a spokesperson of the gods. Although the priest king was merely a spokesperson, what he said was gospel for the Sumerians. In addition, there would be an early form of aristocrats, those of the priestly class, and because they were priests, they had more economic and educational privileges. We also see some emergence of art, which seems to be a byproduct of Sumerian religion. And common artistic themes included uh, humans performing rituals, wars, and animals. Now, concerning marriages, the crux of the matter was in the bride's family. Unless they approved, the marriages weren't allowed. Sumerian society advocated for monogamy, and the family structure was patriarchal. But uh, this does not mean women were oppressed. Rather, it seems like they were well respected. But yes, men did have more authority and privileges. In addition, other religious influences on the Sumerians would be their worldviews, such as their views on death. Alright, so now let's talk a little bit about Sumerian technology. 
they knew that a week consisted of seven days. And we can also infer this from the epic of Gilgamesh. They also had a humongous monument, which we call the Ziggurat of Ur, a hundred feet high and a base of 200 times 150 feet. They also made glass and bronze. And I want to talk a little bit about bronze. So to make bronze, you need two materials, copper and tin. And copper naturally existed in Sumer, but tin didn't. So the fact that they were making bronze strongly suggests they traded tin. And therefore, they probably had a pretty sophisticated trading system. And they are also thought to have invented chariots. Okay, so now that we have a general understanding and feeling of the Sumerians, I want to go over the historical narrative, the timeline of the Sumerians. So earlier, I said that the first civilization started around 4000 BC in a city-state called Eridu. However, as some time passes, lots of other city-states emerged. And some key places that um, are worth mentioning are Ur and Uruk. Okay, so from here, we can roughly create a timeline of the ancient Mesopotamians. First, we have the Archaic period, which lasts between 3360 BC to 2400 BC, about a thousand years. And during this period, the different city-states basically engage in war. Well, it's just a period of war. Eventually, a group of people way up north, called Akkad, comes down and conquers the Sumerians and the whole Mesopotamian region. He would conquer, or this group would conquer, up to Egypt, but not Egypt. And the leader of this group is called King Sargon I. Under his rule, the next, or this period, was named the Akkadian Empire. And this empire, this time period, lasted from 2334 BC to 2154 BC. Under his rule, we see the first state and empire. King Sargon I was not a priest king, but a king. So they weren't really as religious as the Sumerians. However, the Akkadians did share common religious roots with the Sumerians. And again, that's not that surprising considering that they were all in the Fertile Crescent. Now, King Sargon I's family line will continue to rule for about 200 years. And that ends with his great-grandson. The Akkadian Empire was overthrown by some tribal people. The next period after the Akkadian Empire is called the Neo-Sumerian period, which lasts from 2112 BC to 2000 BC, only about 100 years. And the reason this period is called the Neo-Sumerian period is because, well, Power is handed back to the native Sumerians, but they don't seem to be the same Sumerian people. And what I mean is that they seem to be very different. For example, traditional Sumerian art had a focus on religion. But during the Neo-Sumerian period, we see more art that has to do with princes and kings. Next, most probably influenced by King Sargon's legacy, 
The Neo-Sumerians during this period, they tried to expand their territory. And eventually, they were weakened by the Amorites and defeated by the Helamites. The Amorites then drove away the Elamites and they settled in places such as Assyria, which is up north of Sumer, in Damascus, which is more to the northwest of Sumer, and finally in Babylon, located near, near Sumer. At this point, Sumerian tradition disappears, although we see influences of Sumer in later civilizations, especially those that are religious. Sumerian history effectively ends here, and we now are interested, or we enter, the history of Mesopotamia as a whole. So as I just said, one of the places the Amorites settled in, Babylon, right? This place becomes the center of the next empire. This empire lasts for about 400 years, ending in 1600 BC by the hands of the Hittites. During this 400 year span, Babylon goes through some important changes. And one of the most important figures during this time is a king named Hammurabi. Quite a famous figure, to say the least, right? But well, why is he famous? Well, Hammurabi, he was the first ruler to unify all of Mesopotamia. He's also famous for the Hammurabi's Code, a written law of 282 rules, which is what he's probably most known for. One of his famous rule is an eye for an eye. I'm sure a lot of you have heard this saying. Some people misunderstand and assume that Hammurabi created the rules all from scratch, but this is wrong. Actually, he assembled most of the rules from past rulers and tradition. The 282 rules were written on clay and displayed in temples so that anybody in the city can consult it. Now there's a lot of interesting things that relate to the code that I want to talk about from now. First of all, it's said that Hammurabi received the code from the sun god called Shamash. And this god appears in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And as you're probably thinking already, yes, Babylon was a th theocracy. And Babylonian religion seems to have assimilated Sumerian mythology. Hammurabi utilizes the mythology, their mythology, to explain and justify his political authority. Now, um, one key deity in the Babylonian pantheon that I think you should know is called Marduk. I won't go into too much detail. Actually, I won't talk about him. So if you want me to cover Marduk and the Babylonian mythology, please let me know in the comments and I'll make a video about it as well. So going back to the general historical timeline of the Babylonian Empire, um, there's not that much. There's not that many um, important events to know. So just knowing that they existed and that they were destroyed by the Hittites should be sufficient. However, I think it's important to know that the Assyrians and the Babylonians, that these two were originally one people, right? They both came from the Amorites. 
But, you know, they settled in different locations, and it seems like they created their own distinct way of life. And during Hammurabi's reign, the Babylonians conquer Assyria. But further down the line, the Assyrians end up conquering Babylon. And basically, that's the end of this lecture on ancient Mesopotamia. So now, a quick summary. First of all, I defined that a civilization requires the following three things, at least in my estimation. First of all, a certain way of life special to the society. Second, a system of supporting many people. And third, economic surplus. Next, I talked about the Fertile Crescent and that it was a crescent-shaped area in the Middle East where the earliest civilizations formed. And from this Fertile Crescent, in the Southern Eastern region, was a place called Sumer. And this was the first civilization which formed around 4000 BC. As with most ancient civilizations, Sumer was a theocracy, and Sumer's essence were distilled in their mythological account called the Epic of Gilgamesh. The timeline concerning the Sumerians can be separated into three stages the Archaic, Akkadian, and Neo Sumerian period. Long story short, by the end of the Neo-Sumerian period, the Sumerians are conquered by the Amorites, and Sumerian history effectively ends there. The Amorites decide to settle in places such as Babylon and Assyria. And soon after this separation of the Amorites, the Babylonians become a large empire and unifies all of Mesopotamia under King Hammurabi's rule. The Babylonians assimilated Sumerian mythology and organized their civilization around Babylonian myths. And finally, in 1600 BC, Babylon is conquered by the Hittites. And that's the end. And as I've said in the previous lecture, a lot of what I said comes from this book. So please check it out if you're interested. And I'll see you again, uh, hopefully, in my next lecture.